Thanks very much, Stuart. So, yeah, my, my talk follows on very nicely from um, John's. I'm going to talk about, yeah, putting, putting the stuff underground. So capturing the CO2 is only half the job, right, because you've got to store it somewhere. And as John says, you've got to store it for climate scale times, so tens of thousands of years. So I'm going to be talking about subsurface uh, storage. I'll start with... Um, yeah, no, an, an introduction rather similar to John's. Um, this is another plot. This is looking at the IPC special for 2018 and trying to limit warming in different scenarios to one and a half degrees. And we're looking to do that something of the order of a thousand gigatons of CCS. Okay, so it's huge what we need to do. But there are plenty of places to store it. So let's cut straight to the chase. We are in the Geological Society. We are looking at geological storage. So we're looking at um, injecting deep underground into, normally into aquifers, into sedimentary rock. So here are the sedimentary basins across the world. Okay, And so there is potentially a lot of storage space. Pretty good for the UK in the North Sea. Pretty good in uh, North America not so good in parts of China or indeed India. So here are estimates of storage capacity. So if we were to look underground, how much could we store? These are very much sort of upper limits, so assuming that we can take all the pore space. So here we have the overall capacity in blue. The little red ones are where, in fact, we put the CO2 into hydrocarbon reserves, so depleted oil and gas fields. And I'll say a little bit more about that. But again, you can see these are very large numbers. So at the moment, we're not terribly concerned about capacity per se. It's about choosing the right sites and getting started. So um, can we do it? Um, John talked about successful projects that are really about the CO2 capture side. I'm going to show some projects here that are really... Um, about the storage side. So CO2 has been stored underground for enhanced oil recovery really since the 70s. And there are dozens of sites in West Texas where natural sources of CO2 have been injected underground um, in order to improve oil recovery. It's not a, not a climate change thing, but it does work. The CO2 doesn't, uh, doesn't leak out. The specific climate change project, the first one in 1996, so it's been going for over 20 years. This is in the North Sea. Carbon dioxide is separated out of a gas stream. This is normal oil field operations that we would do anyway because we can't sell the gas with the CO2. The default option is you just vent the CO2 to the atmosphere. Instead, this CO2 is injected underground. This is in the Sleipner aquifer, and again, that has been working very well. So we do have experience of this. It's not, again, um, some necessarily untried or untested technology. Here now... Again, goes to some of uh, what John was saying. Here are just some, some proposed, sorry, some active and proposed projects. And you see here that the vast majority of projects that are actually happening are ones that are EUR related. That is, you're injecting into uh, oil and gas fields. And the reason why you're doing that is there is an economic benefit of doing that. You get, uh, you get some revenue. Whereas the ones that are pure aquifer storage are essentially pure cost. OK, so just to give you some idea of the scale of the problem and then some of the physics associated with this. I think you're familiar with this um, idea of a stabilization wedge. But for those of you who are not, um, let's show it. So here we've, we've got. Um, this is billions of tons of carbon, not carbon dioxide, emitted. And here we have a time scale. And this is essentially the, the, uh, the current path. And what we want to do is we want to flatten that path and obviously go down so that we, we hit um, zero net emissions. Now, in John's presentation, we're trying to be even more uh, um, ambitious than that and try and hit uh, zero net emissions uh, somewhat quicker. But the idea is that this is too big a challenge that one single technology is magically going to solve. And so you build it up into a variety of wedges that are going to reduce your, your CO2 emissions. So a wedge is where you're reducing from the base case about 25 gigatons of carbon. So it's still you know, something, of, uh, something of challenge. 
So the idea is we, we need about 15 of these wedges, and they go into a number of categories. Okay, so there's energy efficiency, there's nuclear power, and there's renewables. What I'm talking about here specifically are fossil fuel-based strategies. So you are burning fossil fuels, but, in, but instead of allowing that CO2 to go into the atmosphere, you're storing it deep underground. So John talked about the capture side. The capture itself is, in fact, frankly, the technologically most difficult and the most expensive side. The storage, right, which is essentially now putting it underground, in comparison tends to be cheaper. So here is a graph, actually, that was prepared for China. Um, you can't necessarily read everything here for different types of process. You notice that the numbers start off negative because if you're putting the CO2 underground to improve oil recovery, it actually comes at a benefit. So it uh, has a, I won't say a negative cost. But we're normally looking at a, a, a numbers that are in the 10 or 20 um, pounds per tonne of CO2 stored. And then, how do we actually get this to work? Because this is, I think, one of the key um, things that hasn't happened. We haven't yet managed to create an environment where CCS sort of picks up. Um, but uh, Lord Oxborough, who actually used to um, be the rector of Imperial College, so uh, someone who's sort of close to our hearts, wrote a report a couple of years ago that did propose a policy framework in which CCS um, could be used at scale. So the first was to deal with the expense. The problem with previous projects has been, you build a power station, you're generating power anyway, making money out of this. Oh, and the government's just going to write some checks to do the carbon capture if it works. And of course, the incentives there for everyone is to make sure it doesn't work or to you know, get as many blank checks as you like. And the government, obviously, at some point uh, gives up on that one. So the idea is to create a national CCS um, company that does the full chain of capture, transport, and storage. And what it does is instead is it guarantees there is a guaranteed price for the electricity it generates. So it's actually rather similar to what we try to do with nuclear power plants. We say, OK, you build the nuclear power plant, but we will guarantee we pay you this for the electricity, rather than government <laughs> saying, you're generating cheap electricity, and we'll sort of subsidise it. OK? So that's the, that's the first thing. Um, the idea is to apply CCS quite widely. Um, as we said, not necessarily just for power, but if you have an integrated scheme, you can then do CCS in other, other applications. And then create a market, and of course I'm not, I'm not say so expert in this, but this may be lead on to some of the things that we're going to be talking about later in this conference, um, that actually has an obligation to store an increasing fraction of the CO2 that we emit, largely consistent with this idea from... Uh, that was presented previously, that we, the problem here is not to stop burning fossil fuels, but to stop emitting CO2. So that's sort of, one might say, an introduction. What my expertise is really in on is the CO2 in the subsurf itself. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now to talk about what's going to happen to the CO2 when you inject it. So the first thing to... to think about this, is that when we inject CO2 in the subsurface, we're not talking about a traditional gas. So imagine this balloon, right, 100% of the volume it has, well, let's say, at uh, ambient conditions. When we inject it deep underground, and we're looking at injecting the CO2 a couple of kilometres below the subsurface. The temperatures are slightly elevated, but the pressures are much higher, and so the volume that the CO2 um, occupies is much, much lower. It's a much denser gas. In fact, it has a sort of almost liquid-like uh, density. So it's what's known as a supercritical fluid. For those of you who are not thermodynamicists, no need to panic about that expression, right? It doesn't mean it's about to explode or anything. It's a technical expression that means that it has, as broadly speaking for our purposes, um, it has a liquid-like density but a gas-like viscosity. So it flows very readily in the subsurface, um, but it's relatively dense. Okay, so we inject it deep down into porous rock that originally contains uh, brine. And I emphasise the brine. We're not going to inject into shallow aquifers that could be used for drinking water. We're going to inject into deep aquifers that are very salty, that actually don't have any other use um, for us. So there are five things 
that happen um, when we inject the CO2, and they're more or less in a sort of time sequence. The first thing that happens is you've got some rock that's full of brine and you start injecting a rather large amount of CO2, you're going to increase the pressure because the brine has to move somewhere, you have to dissipate that pressure. So that's the first problem, the pressure goes up, that has um, risks uh, associated with induced fracturing, induced seismicity. Okay, and I would say that's probably number one. It's the first thing that happens, and it's probably the most important. The second thing is carbon dioxide, although it is dense, is not denser than water, so it will tend to move upwards, so maybe a little bit concerned it keeps moving all the way up back to the surface. Okay, so that's how it escapes. The other three happen on larger timescales and, in fact, make the CO2 storage safer and safer. So... Um, in fact, as the CO2 moves, it gets trapped in the pore space. I'm going to show some pictures of that. So you actually get blobs trapped in the pore space, so it stops moving. It can dissolve in water, right, a bit like uh, fizzy drinks. And that solution of the CO2-laden brine is denser than the formation brine, so it sinks. So that's also good. And eventually, in some circumstances, you can have reaction. Essentially, you form a solid uh, carbonate. The point here to emphasise is... CO2 storage is not like nuclear waste storage. Nuclear waste storage, okay, you put the nuclear waste in a repository, and for the next 50 years, while you're monitoring it, there's nothing to worry about whatsoever. 100,000 years later, you can't be so sure. It's likely to have leaked. It's still highly dangerous. And so people often have that idea stuck in their mind, is that we're going to inject a lot of CO2, and then something catastrophic is going to suddenly come bubbling up some years later. The answer is not that. Number one is the worst problem. Number one happens straight away and can be monitored and dealt with. <coughs> Over time, the CO2 gets more and more safely stored in the sense that it's not going to escape. Okay, so those of you who have all industry experience, this makes a lot of sense. We're used to having fluids that have been underground for geological time. We're used to drilling wells and pumping and th doing everything we can to get oil out of the ground, and we're lucky if we get even half. Right? So the idea that we try and design something to be injected underground and it's all going to escape um, seems a bit ridiculous. But for those of you who don't come from a sort of oil background, just remember that. Actually, this, the storage requires careful monitoring to begin with, but on long times gets safer. So let's talk about the pressure build-up. So here I show a graph. Um, There's actually quite a nice paper that had a semi-analytic flow model that analysed how pressure might uh, increase over time for large-scale storage. This is in the continental uh, United States. But what it does is as follows. Rather than having a storage capacity, which is X, it's a storage capacity over time, so there's only so much you can store at a given rate. Okay, so here is how much you can store against how long you were doing it. Okay, so you get this sort of curve like this. So this is your mean of how much you can store, and then this is what your demand might be under different scenarios. So there is a time dependence of this. Okay, so... Um, I've got there what the, the, what the physics is, okay? The volume added to the uh, subsurface increases the, pr the, the pressure, causes fault slippage, um, and that is a common problem. Right? You can see it uh, in fracking operations in the US, largely associated actually with wastewater um, disposal. That doesn't mean to say CO2 storage is impossible, just means it has to be done carefully. Okay. So that's the uh, pressure problem, but the pressure problem is not, as I said, if well managed, is not impossible. Then what happens, secondly, is uh, the buoyant movement of the CO2. So I'm going to give you the example of Sleipner that I mentioned uh, previously. So we inject the CO2 here, and it's less dense than the water, so it tends to rise up. Here we're injecting carbon dioxide into a very high permeability sandy layer, and so the pressure build-up in this particular example is very small. So we can actually observe what's going on. These are what are called four-dimensional seismic surveys. So we send sound waves underground at various times, and we can actually see how the CO2 is migrating. And you see over time, okay, we're injecting more and more CO2. That all makes uh, perfect sense. 
What exactly is going on, and can we quantify, can we predict it? Well, that's, uh, I'm not going to wade into that particular controversy, but even quite simple models, at least qualitatively, can get the, the right sort of behaviour. So what, is, what we think is happening is we're injecting here, the CO2 rises up, it reaches a barrier to flow, moves along the barrier, then goes up, then goes up, then goes up. Okay? And it will eventually reach a final barrier here, so it's not, in fact, going to go to the surface. So the CO2 does migrate upwards. You do rely on having some low permeability layer um, that will limit the CO2 flow. Now, what else can happen? So here is a cartoon, so the CO2 moves up. It will also dissolve in the brine and then begin to sink, so that is good. And then the other process, and actually rather rapid process, is when the CO2 moves, it doesn't move as some big bubble from here to here. It's moving through porous rock. And so the water, or brine, has to displace the CO2 and trap bubbles in the porous rock. So if we want to understand the fluid flow, these are the three things. Um, there's a pressure difference between the phases, which is called capillary pressure. There is a relative permeability that essentially says how well does CO2 move in the presence of brine. So for those of you not familiar with it, I won't go through the details, but it's, it's another property that's a function of saturation. And the last one that is important is how much do you trap? So as the CO2 moves, it gets trapped in the pore space, and this is how much is trapped as a function of how much you put in in the first place. So the more you put in, the more you trap. So we uh, measure these things um, in our own laboratories. So we have uh, a suite of laboratories. Um, we can do flow experiments, but we also look, we use x-rays to look inside the rock. So we can actually see what's happening, but albeit small pieces of rock, because these, this trapping mechanism is, in fact, a microscopic uh, process. So here, this is a medical CT scan that you may be familiar with. You can put rock cores as well as human beings in there and look inside them. We also have a high-resolution x-ray microscope, so you have a sample... It's about half a millimetre to a, millim to a centimetre, sorry, half a s five millimetres to a centimetre across, and we can image down to a resolution of about a micron. So we can really see what's happening in the pore space. And this is what we see. So this is a piece of rock, small piece of rock, about two centimetres long. We inject CO2, that's what's shown in blue, and then the CO2 moves on. So what the different colours here are isolated blobs of CO2 in the pore space. So they're surrounded by water, they're not going to move. So they're quite safely trapped. So we can actually see that happening. Okay, so these, we've got lots and lots of different results, and we can actually get this how much is trapped against how much we put in. And that's a, a curve. And if we put in, say, 60%, so 60% of the pore space contains CO2 originally, about half of that, about 30%, um, gets trapped. If we do it in an oil field, we get something rather interesting. So here are some more experiments. These are just looking, zooming into a piece of rock. Okay, here we have oil shown in green. We water flood. Actually, oil can be trapped in the pore space. But then we can do gas injection and then water flood. And what happens here is we get a rather interesting phenomenon where oil traps gas. So the oil spreads, like oil would spread if you spilt some oil on a pond, for instance. The oil spreads between the water and gas, surrounds the gas, traps the gas, right? and then the oil can get trapped itself. So in fact, actually, um, if we uh, inject CO2 into an oil field and combine that with injecting water, then actually potentially is a very nice storage mechanism. Now, we've looked at uh, lots of other systems, so here are some... Um, different sandstones, and we're looking how much is trapped against how much we put in. And basically, we about trap about half of what we put in. So what this means, if you sort of think about it, is you've got some CO2, now it moves to here, but half of it's got trapped. So now you've only got half left, and then another half left, and so on. So basically, you're limiting the plume movement actually really quite severely. So it's not that CO2 is going to be move around the pore space, find some cunning way to escape, and eventually it's all going to be nonsense. Actually, no, because this trapping mechanism, in the long term, um, it's very unlikely that uh, much is going to escape, if any. When we look at real rocks, which are heterogeneous, so they have structure on all sorts of, on all scales, so we're not just looking at the micron level. Actually, we get more trapping because wherever there's some barrier to flow, in this case we're going to get more trapping because it prevents the CO2 moving. So heterogeneity um, actually helps in this case. In a CO2 context, we've looked at this. The degree of trapping may be slightly less than on the other graphs, but we're looking at heterogeneous rocks, so we actually can trap even more than what we say, a base case curve. So we're looking uh, 
uh, residual saturation, trap saturation, 40, 50 percent. So it's going to work. So where would CO2 storage happen in the UK? And I'm sort of finishing here. So we're blessed by having uh, an infrastructure for dealing with fluids, a large number of uh, possible formations where we can store CO2, both aquifers and uh, depleted oil and gas fields. So under reasonable assumptions, we have plenty of capacity for any uh, proposed projects. And the limiting factor in my mind is more the expense of the capture. So the last point here, and again, it, it's put from a sort of engineering perspective that sometimes is, is not really thought through. Often people think, yes, you're going to inject the CO2, and then you just sit there monitoring it, and if something goes wrong, it's a disaster. Right? So if there's a risk of something going wrong, you sort of, oh dear, you sort of flap around. But from an engineering perspective, that's not what you do. You, you don't do this passively, you do it actively. So if you're injecting and your pressure is going too high, which you can measure, you stop injecting. Or you can have relief wells that would actually produce, for instance, brine and relieve the pressure. Okay? So it's not a question of, oh, what happens if you were to inject into the wrong area? This would be a total catastrophe and you'd be inducing huge earthquakes. No, you'd monitor the pressure, you'd design it so you try and avoid it. The second thing is, how would you encourage trapping? Here's just an example of where we considered, this is at a much larger scale, so we're now at kilometre scales, where we consider injecting CO2 and then actually injecting brine following it to trap the CO2. And you can trap actually the CO2 really very, very rapidly in just a few years. Okay? And we can also design the enhanced trapping in oil fields. So remember this is a designed process and we can respond to what's happening in the subsurface to ensure that it's efficient as possible. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna finish there. We got plenty of capacity in principle. Um, there are a number of processes that occur in the subsurface, but in general, they will combine over the long term to make that storage relatively safe. Certainly, the, the movement and trapping of CO2 is reasonably well understood. I won't say there have been no surprises at all from field scale projects, but again, we haven't been completely uh, <laughs> what I say, uh, shocked by what we've seen. Um, and then the last point is, if we don't do this, right, and if we don't do this at large scale, then I'm afraid I think we are um, condemned to serious climate change. So I'd end here by uh, thanking um, actually the sponsors of various companies that have uh, generously funded my work. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, and of course, and Stuart, whose uh, slides I shamelessly copied, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's to copy, anyway. Uh, right, questions for Martin? Ten minutes we've got yeah, at the back there. Um, uh, uh, Malcolm Brown, uh, previous president. What's the chance of the, the interaction between doing all this into offshore fields and the offshore fields still being there and being in the right condition to be used? Because after a while, the oil companies who own them will want to decommission them because they'll have no, you know, the, the economics will, will run out. So yes, I think, I think that's... This, in, the, in the 10 years, not much has happened. In the 10 year, and the, the fields are all 10 years older, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, that, I first heard that argument 20 years ago, and it's not getting any better. So you're right, as the fields get uh, more in decline and the infrastructure gets older, the, the, the cost of injection goes up and the economic benefit of any improved oil recovery goes down. And, and that, that's just been a, a lack one might say, of political and financial imagination to let it take off, unfortunately. Hello, uh, John Underhill, Harriet Watt. Um, you haven't talked very much about the ultimate seal and the need for the physical and, moreover, the chemical uh, nature of that seal to, to be um, robust. And I'm thinking here about... Uh, CO2 reacting with water to form carbonic acid. So if you had a, a marley seal, mm -hmm. you potentially have a reaction. And so there are good places and less um, good places to put the CO2 in, depending on the chemistry of the seal or indeed it, its physical nature. So like a series of sieves that um, 
CO2 is a smaller, more nimble molecule and might escape where a long chain hydrocarbon would be retained. So could you say some comments about ultimate ceiling potential? Yes, so, so we have looked at this. I just didn't, didn't have time in the presentation to talk about the work we've done. We've actually looked at um, dissolution processes in the presence of supercritical CO2 and brine. So I, I, I agree it's potentially a concern. I think, again, it's something that can be designed because the question is, so first of all, in many cases, if we have a system that's relatively inert and well buffered, in fact, you can have cases where you don't even need, one would say, an ultimate seal. So the good, a good example is these large regional open aquifers. You need something to stop the CO2 going straight up but the fact that it could, in theory, get to the, the seabed is largely irrelevant because it helps dissipate the pressure, but the CO2 gets trapped. So that's why I, I talked about the trapping mechanism. More of a concern will be cases that are a little bit more confined, and the CO2 can actually then rest there at high saturations for a long time. And again, that, that's something that we, to be honest, I think we need, we need to look at very carefully, and you need to have the proper research to make sure that you understand what's likely to happen and you don't dissolve away that way that cover up. Um, Emma Cairns from Quintessa and ex-oil industry. I have two parts to my question. The first is, would you say it's easy to, easier to characterise the accessible area for CO2 in an ex-oil um, reservoir because you'd have more information about the connected pore space? Or, um, or is it just as easy to characterise a new area and there, therefore would that impact on costs for doing it? And secondly... Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the first one, because you make actually a very good point, because if you have an oil field, it's economically beneficial to spend a lot of money on a detailed characterisation. Seismic, to look at the structure, um, well logs, um, direct <coughs> measurements of rock properties, those all come at a cost. Mm -hmm. Now the problem, so, so you're right, if you inject into a depleted oil and gas field, you do have a, in general, you're going to have a better characterization because if you're doing it in an aquifer, these come at a cost and it is presented as just cost. Where's the benefit? So that is a concern. I think it's less of a concern in some regions where we feel we have a sort of, I would say, good analogue understanding like the North Sea, mm -hmm. but if we were to roll this out globally, I think there would be areas, yeah, where we would have to invest in proper characterisation in much the way the oil industry does. Okay. Um, second part of the question, so where you demonstrated you could actually use oil to trap CO2, in, under what circumstances would you do that? Because obviously there's been oil left in oh, the wait, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Sorry, yeah, you could mis mistake it. No, I'm not in talking about injecting um, oil at all. I'm looking about an oil field... Yeah. At low, so, so you're injecting CO2 into an oil field. But actually, in enhanced oil recovery applications, you normally don't just inject CO2. What you do is you inject CO2 in water. It's cheaper, but it actually leads to a more efficient displacement. So when you do this, the water injection, the water will actually push both CO2 and oil. And what we found at the pore scale is what happens is it's the water pushes oil that traps CO2... Okay, and that's, that's then good for storage. Right, okay. right, and the water is also pushing this oil and then it gets produced, okay? Uh, it's been observed that in the strike-slip regime, when you inject fluid, it migrates downwards. Is it possible to viscosify CO2 in some form and inject that will leave CO2 permanently at a great depth? <laughs> that's not really what we're looking at here. It doesn't doesn't make much economic sense because obviously as you go deeper and deeper it costs more and you tend to be in lower for permeability formations. So we're looking here at injecting into formations you know, that the oil industry is familiar with in conventional reservoirs. So it's not, the CO2 is less dense than brine so it does tend to migrate upwards but it has an injectivity that's favourable. That's it. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Off the